Welcome back to Jim Paisley Podcast. This has to be one of my favorite, just real and genuine conversations that I've sat down with somebody. Sarah Kaki, um, if you don't know her, of her, she is a refugee from Iran. She's an attorney. She's a superhero mom of almost three kids, <laughs> owner of two different million dollar law firms, and conquer of the American dream. Um, this was such an enriching conversation, and I'm so excited that y'all get to listen to it. So tell me what you think. And um, if you have a disability claim and, or you need uh, help with any family law issue, then certainly look up Sarah Kaki's law firms. They are, um, they do extraordinary work for their clients. And so without further ado, she barely needs an introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Kaki. So how are y'all doing with isolation with, um, two kids and all that? Um, I think it's been, honestly, I wouldn't change a thing about it. Um, really? Be, yeah. Because for us, I was having this conversation with David Nagel. There was a lot of things that we had grown up without and we worked really hard to get such as cleaning services, such as, um, all the help with the kids that we need such as getting your nails done as often as you need to getting your lashes done you know um well those are some of the more obviously superficial things but really I'm thinking more about we had a we've had a lot of services and help around our house and we worked really hard to get to a point where we could create um a life where a lot of those chores were not on our plate so we could truly play with the kids or we could truly dive into our work and not feel guilty about laundry stacking up or groceries and all that stuff. We cut all that out because of the quarantine. Um, and because we have, um, our help has always been our parents. We pay for our moms to come and help us with the kids. We cut that out because we wanted to protect them. Um, they're elderly and we didn't, we didn't want them to be exposed to anything. And we didn't realize how attached we had become to these luxuries of life until we went through this and getting detached from them has been amazing because it's put so much of life into perspective of like, what do you actually really need? And I'm not saying we're not going to go back and use all those services, but I think we'll go back and have a much more healthier relationship with those services than that feeling of, I can't do without, you know, having nannies. I can't do without having my grocery shops for me because then those things aren't luxury anymore. And because now you have a dysfunctional attachment to them and we didn't realize the, I, for me personally, maybe Hisham was a lot, I think he might've probably been a lot more ahead of me mindset wise on that. I didn't realize that there were a lot of life hacks I had created for myself in order to work more, but we, do all this work, we create all this life for ourselves in order to have more time to enjoy ourselves more. But what I found is that what we had done is done all this work to spend more money, to create more life hacks, to do less of these things so we could work even more. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So, but now you're doing all those things and still working just as much. I probably never worked more than I am. Now. Yeah. Hisham's probably never worked more. Well, you know, Hisham has. Hisham's, what he's put through in the corporate world when he was in the corporate world is insane. But I've never worked more than I have in the past two months. Um, yes, I'm working that much. Um, I, we've been, we homeschooled our kids to the end on our own. We did all of our own cleaning. We did all of our own domestic help. We did all of our own cooking. Um, We've obviously had options and multiple times we discussed the options of, do we get somebody to come in and live with us? Do we bring the cleaning people back? But I think we almost hit a point where we kind of had a competitiveness where we were like, let's just, let's just do this, you know, let's just do this and um, say that we did it and uh, test our capacity and break all those attachments we have to all those things and our kids have loved it and then there's things that like you know when you become 
a professional woman, you're told that, oh, you should delegate all these things away as quickly as you can, such as cooking, cleaning, all these things. But my kids now are obsessed with me cooking for them. I didn't even know they would ever enjoy my cooking. And it's how do you delegate that away when your kids are eating your pasta and they're just loving it? They're like, mom's pasta is the best. Or my daughter wants to come in the room and fold clothes with me now. And she, she's like, how do I fold clothes? I'm like, you know what? Like she's never shown any interest in these things. And this is just a time for us to give them a little bit of that um, and not be so attached to all the help that we considered to be luxuries, but they really were more like life hacks so that you could just work more. But yes, it's been challenging. It's been very, very challenging. It's been a lot of ups and downs, um, but I wouldn't change a thing. Like we've just, as a family, we've learned so much about each other and um, got a much more clear vision of what are we doing all this for? Right. First of all, I would say, um, I will trade kids with you anytime you want. And, um, but your, your two children, how old are they? Hannah is five. She just turned five and Rami's about to turn eight. So roughly the same age as our kids. Um, Mm -hmm. we have eight and six. Um, the homeschooling went really well for the eight year old for the six year old. Anna was a little bit more challenging. Um, kindergarten, you know, the, the finishing up the school year is really where they learn how to read. And, um, yeah. and I, I just can't say enough about, you know, their mom, my wife, Katie. I mean, she's just been amazing through this whole thing. She's cooked, you know, the vast majority of meals. Um, at the same time, she's kept up her professional life as well. And the yoga teaching gig as well. So wow. it's been pretty cool. I mean, it's and we, did not cut out everything. And I think, yes, uh, cutting out those things that makes you respect them more. But the one thing we did not let go of was the cleaning service. You know, I think that's just one thing we realized, I think in 2010, even if we were, you know, absolutely growing, going broke, we would probably the cleaning service would be the last thing we give up because we both, we love a tidy house, but we both hate, you know, the, the full scale um, of what it takes, whether it's dusting the fans at the top or the vents, you know, um, the blinds, there's things you can do yourself that just don't get done like a cleaning service. I completely would. So agree. I feel yeah. like of everything that we've done, the one thing that I would say has added no value in us doing it ourselves. I can't say that there was a life lesson in there for us was the cleaning. And the only reason we continue to cut that off is because I'm pregnant and Hisham just felt wanting to overprotect us on allowing anything coming in and the um, doctors were just like you know we don't really know how this is impacting pregnant women we don't expect it to but just be extra cautious but I completely agree I don't see much value in doing that myself I don't see the added value I do see that in the cooking I see that in some of the more some of the other things like teaching your kids yourself doing bedtime yourself but um, I, I don't see how not giving up time with their kids outside to clean a house is doing anything for anybody. Yeah. There are so many crazy and um, amazing topics I could go in with you um, as far as you and your husband, both, both entrepreneurs, uh, both parents, and um, you have two law firms. But first, real quick, um, for anyone listening who doesn't know you, doesn't know of you, I think your story is kind of remarkable. Um, And dare I say origin story, I think I've used that term before, but um, you know, like where you came from. And I think because it's remarkable as far as what it says about your entrepreneurial spirit, especially given the times that we are looking at right now, um, envisioning opportunity as opposed to, oh shit, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So if you could speak on that, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, Yeah, so I was born in Iran in 1983 when four years after the revolution had occurred where uh, the Shah had been ousted by uh, the crazy Islamic Republic and um, my parents were not a huge fan um, of the Islamic Republic. They had been revolutionaries during the time of uh, the revolution, but they were student revolutionaries who were fighting for democracy. They weren't fighting for an Islamic Republic. And 
for anybody that just doesn't know, um, the students who w were the revolutionaries, their revolution was hijacked by the Islamic Republic, um, last, literally last minute. That's not what the, gov the government they were fighting for. And that's who my parents were. They were hippie revolutionaries um, in the 70s in Iran. And um, so four years later, I was born after the revolution. And, um, and it was three years into the war between Iran and Iraq. Um, when Saddam had basically taken advantage of Iran's um, vulnerability after the revolution. And I was, I, rem I moved out of Iran when I was close to three years old. So the first three years of my life, um, we lived, uh, it was, it, we lived very luxury life in Tehran, but that luxury was in the midst of war where bombs were being dropped in Tehran. And I do have some memories of running into the, bomb shelters in the basement with my family. I remember the alarms going off. I don't remember having any sort of panic or, or any um, PTSD from it. Uh, it really is similar to what people describe the London bombings were during World War II, where it's just part of life. People had become used to it by that point, because by that time, you know, we're talking three years into the war, it's just, it, it was what it was. And that was the way of life. You stood in line, no matter how rich or poor you were, you stood in line to get to use your coupon to get milk for your baby. Um, if you wanted diapers for your baby, you had to go stand in line with a coupon. Like all these things were, Iran was completely cut off from the world economy. Um, so money wasn't gonna buy you some of those very necessities. And so this toilet paper thing is actually, um, it's funny cause I asked my parents stories about the revolution, the war and how, you know, literally getting your baby milk was a big deal. A formula was a big deal. But um, a lot of, so we, my, my dad really did not see a future for his children with what was happening to the country. And uh, even though they were more fortunate, they had a lot of means. One of the things that really has been a, sh a shape to who I am is really my dad's mindset about detachment. Um, he comes from a good family in Iran that was very well connected, but he had no problems detaching himself from that. He had no problems selling, problem easily selling the condo in Tehran and um, selling all we had and doing it as secretly as he could to get the money to a smuggler to get the family over to the borders of Sweden. He had two visas that the smuggler got him. He got him a visa to Sweden or he got him a visa to Brazil. And he was like, which one do you want? And at the time he knew that the education system in Sweden was better. So he's like, I'll pick Sweden. Um, and he smuggled us all the way to Switzerland and um, at the Swiss airport, the guy called my dad, my dad to call him from a payphone or something crazy like that. And he was like, okay, for the next leg from Zurich to Stockholm, I'm going to need like another 10 grand. I mean, this is back in 1983. And my dad's like, what? <laughs> and I don't know how it all went down. One day I'm going to have to have my dad write the book on this, but he wired him the money and, um, the thing was we had to enter Sweden with nothing on us and just and so that they would take us into custody because the rule was that they would only take you in as a refugee if they if you show nothing you prove, prove have proof of no identity otherwise they'll just send you back but if you have no proof of identity they'll just take you into custody you're, you're pretty much under arrest so they took the whole family in and they put us in and my dad just you know kind of the explained that we're refugees and um they put us in the most northern point of scandinavia called kirana which is where the tundra is um like maybe two months of sunshine i don't even recall but they put us in a refugee camp over there so they could figure out what to do with us and i have the best memories of this refugee camp um how, how I really, old were you when you got up point, there i'm like three and a half four close to four so I was, in, I was in that refugee camp until I was like four and a half. So I'm looking at my daughter now, and it's like the age my daughter was. Um, like yeah. getting closer to five. Like you have no idea. <laughs> I know, I know. And the refugee camp was so cool because my memory of it as a child. Um, and I think this is important because I think some children, it, you just, it just depends on your parents' outlook on life. And this is what I tell pa parents who are dealing with coronavirus is, we look to our parents to decide how we felt about these things. And my dad showed such a, 
excitement over adventure, over a new country, and so much excitement over a new opportunity, that that's what I fed off of. And I know my mom, I know now that she was actually going through some depression over it. But thankfully, like, I wasn't aware of that. I was just, like, taken away by my dad's excitement over, like, a new life that he could create for his family that wasn't guided by what his parents had done or what was going on in his country. And so he made everything exciting to us. He's like, oh, my God, guys, like, snow. And the refugee facility would let us borrow snow gear. And he was like, let's go learn how to snow. Let's let's go and um, hike through the woods and we would get in sleds and he would push us through sleds to go grocery shopping because we didn't have a car. And he just completely emerged us into this new experience and made it so fun and exciting. And I have really good memories of the refugee camp. I just remember being on lockdown with my parents and having my parents to myself 24 seven. And we were playing, we were finding things outside to play in and to discover new things which sounds a lot like the opportunity we were just given, correct? Sounds pretty familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's what happened there. And then I think six months in, they gave us um, status and they let us move, move into the country. And we moved as far south as south goes in Sweden. <laughs> well, what what city a, did you move to? Actually, it wasn't that south, but it was, it's called Vetlanda, which didn't get the status of a city till like 1930s or 40s because it was a village. <laughs> but it was a population of maybe less than 20,000 people, very, very small town, four hours south of Stockholm, and much warmer than here and where we were. Wow. And we grew up there from eight, I, was grow, I, I lived there till I was close to 13 years old. Um, my parents made an amazing life for us. They assimilated into the Swedish culture really quickly. What about language? I know. Did I, I know you? I know you learned the language, but did they? My parents did. So I think at this point, my um, they were in their early to mid thirties, and um, they had all that fire in them, right? They had all that fire in them to just like make it. So my dad, my mom very early on was like, I am going to make something out of myself in this country. I will not take any handouts. She was very like adamant about we will not be on welfare in the European system, blah, blah, blah. My dad went from being a architecture and a school teacher in, in Iran to being a factory worker in Sweden, um, blue collar factory worker. My mom went from giving up her high school teaching degree in Sweden to go in, in Iran to completely re having to go through re-education in Sweden um, so she was in school, like when we moved, when we got our status and we moved to Vietlanda, she was working nonstop between getting her teaching degree so she could teach, um, primary education and learning the language, but they very quickly got us to a point where when other Iranians or immigrants were moving into the city or coming in, they were kind of put up as examples of this is how you do it. And, you know, uh, this might be polarizing thing to say, but it is part of my story. My parents really wanted to set themselves up, set themselves apart from how other immigrants were in, working in the system. Um, they really, they could really tell from the, because Sweden is a socialist country and they could really, did not want to feel like they were a burden on that society, that the taxes of Swedish people was what was running our family. They really wanted to do their part to give and be a productive part of that community. And they did that um, as hard as they could. They, my mom was a school teacher there for years. My dad was a, worked in those factories for years until the factory shut down and he was laid off. And after that, he went into creating, trying to get patents for his inventions because he always had a very creative spirit. Um, but they, they made sure that we were, we were model Swedish citizens and, um, you know, we're not a burden on that society because they felt very much a, felt a sense of gratitude and indebtedness for what Sweden had provided for us. How did y'all get to the U.S.? So my uncles, they moved to U.S. before we had moved to Sweden. Um, some of them had moved after us or some of them moved before, but most of our family had moved to the U.S. That's what the most, most of Iranians left for U.S. because... The United States is a very close replica to what Iran was during the time of the Shah as far as capitalism. And um, Iranians at heart 
they're business owners at heart. They're entrepreneurs and hustlers. <laughs> so if anybody that knows Iranians listening to this, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And so the United States is just such a good place for them to be and express themselves. And my mom in 96, I'm sorry, 95 was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And we were in Sweden at the time. And I was um, 12 years old at the time. And she only, she was not supposed to make it. She had a 20% chance of survival. And a year later, she was still with us. She went through chemotherapy. She was still with us. And when it, and her prognosis improved to the point where the doctors were like, we think that some, they were like, we think you have 10 more years. We think you're going to get it. You're not, you know, you're going to survive it. You're going to be fine. You're going to be in remission for a while. But we think within 10 years, you'll probably get it again and you won't make it. And it was one of those moments where she was like, I want to do something different. And I think they had gotten to a point where they really wanted to be in, a, in, in an environment where they could build and grow. And they had not, they kind of felt like they had tapped that out in Sweden, given the socialist climate, given the fact that my dad was inventing things and wanting to get patents, but had so much government red tape over his head because of the way the system is set up. And also because she, I think she wanted to be closer to her family at that time. And U.S. had always been like, an ideal vision of where you can go and the opportunities are endless and your children can become whatever they want. So my aunt, uh, we, we, one summer in 96, a year after she had gone through all her chemo, they were like, why don't you guys just come visit us? This is the Olympics, the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. They're like, just come visit us for the summer. And you were 13, like, okay. you were 13 years old, right? Yeah, I was 13. And so we get on a plane, I think it was July 20th. I think it's the opening ceremony of the 96 Olympics. We come into Atlanta and um, I mean, it was so big. I remember just my stomach being in a pit. I'm like, oh my God, this place is so big. I'm coming from a village, right? And then um, my aunt and uncle, like one, two weeks in, they are already sitting my family down. They're like, listen, we own these gas stations. We can start another gas station with you. We have a great immigration attorney who... By the way, his part of Troutman Sanders here in Atlanta. His name is Mark Newman. Um, he's helped our entire family get status in this country, and we can do it through an E2 visa, which is a business investment. We can take all the life, sell everything in Sweden, and put the money in the U.S. economy and start a business here with us, and let's get you here. And then, um, and then before we knew it, like two weeks into this vacation in the United States, it's supposed to be four weeks, my parents are seriously talking about never going back again. And then they come and sit down with my brother and I, and they ask me, what do you want? And I, and I was just enamored with the United States. I was just like, you know, this is the era of like Nike, Michael Jordan. Like this is, you know, I was just like, yes, yes, yes. And yes. I mean, I've watched Saved by the Bell. I've watched 90210. I know what the schools <laughs> look like here. There's football players and there's cheerleaders. This place is going to be amazing. I want, I want all of that. And they're like, um, I was all for it. Um, my brother wasn't, he was in high school in Sweden. He was, you know, 17 years old, starting his junior year in, in a country where he doesn't really quite speak the language yet. And we looked very European. It wasn't like the era of Facebook where everybody looks the same because social media has told everybody what to look like and act like Europeans look like Europeans. Americans look like Americans. Middle Easterns look like Middle Easterns. You know what I mean? So describe for me what y'all looked like as far as we European. Had very skinny jeans. <laughs> We had very skinny jeans. We did not have right, the right sneakers. We had regular shoes. Um, we had probably clothes that were all just a little bit tighter than what Americans are comfortable with. We didn't understand the concept of like the cool big jeans and the white sneakers that you wear with like a Tommy Hilfiger shirt. Um, the brands we were into weren't over here yet or vice versa. We didn't know the right music. Um, we didn't use the right like slang. Um, we had learned English, like British English. So we would, we sounded really funny. We had very deep Swedish accents. Uh, just Persian people with dark hair, you know, looking dressed like Europeans with Swedish accents. I mean, we, we made no sense. I can only imagine a Iranian that learns Swedish and then English, uh, what that accent sounds like. So, oh really? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
That is amazing. So did y'all go back? No, we stayed. How did you, um, how did you get all your, how'd you get all your shit back over here? <laughs> yeah, we didn't. So we moved into a three bedroom apartment. Um, my dad started working at my uncle's gas station. We, we moved right into Alpharetta. My dad started working at my ga- dad, uh, uncle's gas station in Agnes Scott college, which from Alpharetta is a long drive. Um, and it was not in a safe neighborhood. So he's in a culture shock of his own coming in from a like Swedish little village factory to like Agnes Scott college, um, gas station in a not very safe area of Atlanta at the time. Um, we had one car that he bought in a car auction for, I think maybe $2,000 and the whole family had to share that. Thankfully, we had a lot of family that helped us as far as like getting us to the grocery store if we needed to, telling us how to go and open up a bank account. But my brother, at this point, if they're, keep in mind, my parents are getting close to their 50s. And so my brother and I had to step up. Um, my brother's 17. I'm thir- 13 going on 14. We had to learn the language. We were learning the English a lot faster than my parents. Um, but we had to help them. Like, we would have to go help them get their lease on their apartment. If they wanted to get a car, we had to help them get a car. If they had insurance issues, we had to help them with all these things. And I think that served me and my brother really well in just, like, you figure it out. You get thrown in there and you figure it out and you get put in front of these adults at the bank or at the leasing department office at the apartment who are looking at you and they're like, we don't typically like to speak to a 14 year old child. We'd like to speak to your mom and dad about this. And you're like, this is what you're going to get lady. You're going to talk to me because my parents need me to help you through this. And so you, you kind of get that grit where you're like, you're not, you have to just build that skin really quickly to help your parents out. I and see. we wanted to shield our parents as much as we could too, because they've made this decision for our future. And so we wanted to play a part and like, what do you mean do shield them? To help them? Well, you know, my mom had just survived cancer. Mm. So we constantly were this, had this concern of like, let's not put her under too much. Let's just take care of her. And quite frankly, we were scared to death of like, um, violence at the gas station. There'd been a number of incidents, incidences where, you know, my dad had, there had been robberies at the gas station. My dad worked at where there'd been, he'd been held at gunpoint. My brother would go work at the gas station with him at, the, at his night shift while he was working while he was in school, just to make sure that like he could be there and be there with my dad in case like things happened, but they worked behind a bulletproof glass windows. And still, I mean, there was, this is completely brand new. This is a culture shock for somebody coming from Sweden. We don't worry about these things over there. Um, and these were just, we didn't know how to, my brother and I just felt like we had to do our part every way we could to help our parents. Yeah, that is quite the shock. I can imagine, you know, you had a, I guess a, a good life in Sweden where I, I've been to Sweden actually once. And oh, yeah. um, I think that, yeah, the, um, the last thing you'd worry about, I mean, I remember going for a walk in you know, downtown Stockholm at 1am and being 15 years old and not worrying about anything, you know? Just yeah, like, when I was ten, I would ride my bicycle to all my pra- all my basketball practices and tennis, anything. Like, you just we'd live outside till eleven o'clock when it would be light outside during the summer. Um, yeah, th- just that's a huge difference, obviously. And I would, I can't imagine a better childhood than the one we had in Sweden. But I do think that there is no other country better than this country as far as giving you the opportunity to grow as a person and challenging yourself. And I, I, I love that about the United States. Are you talking to your friends in Sweden now through the whole coronavirus? I am. I am. Um, you know, obviously Sweden's handled it differently. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? I think it was pretty smart. <laughs> I do. Sure. Um, I would, I, I won't, I won't I shame it, you for that opinion. I go, I, I <laughs> shouldn't, don't shame me. I'm not wearing a mask either right now, but <laughs> <laughs> you're at home you know it's fine <laughs> yeah this is true i'm not i'm not at the grocery store it's obviously i think people are going to have a belief system and they are going to find the facts to validate that belief system i just come from a high risk tolerance belief system that's just who i am so I'm not here to shame or put down on anybody that does not have that but I can't help but have that just because of how I've grown up and what I've seen. 
And to me, I was, I was of a different mindset of the cost benefit analysis of, you know, about, um, reducing the risk of spread versus shutting down an economy. Right. I, had a, I had a different feeling about that. However, I can't, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, um, I have no, zero credibility to say we made the right decision or wrong decision. All I know is that a decision was made as a business owner, as a mother, and um, as a wife, I had an obligation to my family and to my employees to be socially conscious about the decision that was made by the government and the way and, and, our, and our culture. And I wanted to make sure I did my part in that, even if I didn't completely agree with how it played out. And I also have to be mindful that I lead teams and I have clients who have a different risk tolerance than me. And I have to be a leader for them and meet them where they're at and where they're com- what, the, what their comfort level is. I can't shove down their throat to live with certain risks that I'm comfortable with. So that's how I felt about it. And obviously, if, you're, if we're going to get down to like a real like debate, if I'm going to sit down and have a real debate with somebody and we're going to put away our hats as lawyers, parents, um, children, and uh, business owners, I am going to use the, sweet, the facts of Sweden that they, you know, and, and validate my belief system that we could have tolerated a little bit more risk. Sure. I, um, I was fine with whatever we decided so long as the experts were considering the total public health impact of a shutdown economy. You know, what does that look like as far as domestic violence, as far as right. you know, mental health issues, uh, people that are not getting um, early care for something that needs checking up. And then that results in something that, you know, passes a point of no return later. And that's not anything I heard really anyone talking about. And that's, that's sort of, I mean, not to get on my soapbox, but that was one thing that I wanted to hear more about that I just did. And I think we're hearing more about that now. And I think that's why it is more of a assess your own risk and um, try to open up as much as you can. Yeah. 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 But um, let's move. Okay. And I don't know if you finished your story there as far as moving here. You're 13 or I'm sorry, 96, you move here. You have the gas station. Dad's held a gunpoint, obviously a culture you're not used to. Um, do y'all still have the gas station? If so, what happened to it? Yeah, so we, he, awesome story. Agnes Scott College came and bought out the, through eminent domain, um, bought the gas station and gave, bought the property to build more par- parking space over there. So that my dad got, that kind of set us up nicely because um, he invested and he got a return on his investment. Then they bought another um, convenience store, uh, this time closer to Perimeter College, um, like in the perimeter area. And I think they built that up, added value to that property, added value to that store. I probably bought oh. beer there when um, I was taking transient <laughs> classes when I was at Georgia Tech. But anyway. You know what? There was actually a lot of students there. Um and then in 2002, sold that, and he bought a foreclosed property in um, Dawsonville. And he's been running a, uh, he, he has a, him and my uncle own a shopping strip. And they have, there's a gas station in there, a number of other things off of, in Dawsonville, off of Highway 53. And it's been great watching Dawson, the city of Dawsonville grow and his business grow with it. And, um, you know what? That gas station's been doing really well through the coronavirus. It's where it's become like your local mom and pop shop. And um, yeah, I'm really excited for my dad. I mean, he's like in his 70s now, and he's he's just watched this business his business grow. And he's um, he made he made a bet. He's made a couple of huge bets in his life, and it's really paid off. The first one was being called crazy by everybody in Iran when he gave up everything, sold everything, gave up all title, all names, being the son of a colonel and saying, I'm out, <laughs> you know, and and he really, a lot of people were like, where are you taking your children? You are crazy. But he, he followed his instincts and then he did it again, um, despite the very comfortable life we had in Sweden. And um, he's, um, I, I just admire him so much for what he's done. Let's finish the... Um miraculous story of uh, your mother and healing there. What, how's your mom now? 
my mom is awesome. Um, she, she's the one that introduced me to a lot of mindset work because that's what we work through to get her um, to a place where she healed. We would literally be crawled up in bed together um, when I was 12 and she, was, she had her diagnosis and we would be studying Rumi, the, uh, the ancient philosopher. We would be studying um, Louise O'Hay, who wrote The Alchemy of Healing. The book is called You Can Heal Your Life. To this day, when somebody gets a, a, an illness, my mom goes to the hospital and like brings that book to them. It's like, this book changed my life. And she realized how much of her healing was in her own hands. And the doctors were there. It was almost like what I said about you have a belief and then you, you use the facts to validate your belief. And so she just really absorbed this belief that I'm going to be fine. I'm going to heal. I'm going to be fine. And then from there, it was just a matter of, Dr. A, are you going to give me the information I need to validate my belief or are you not? If you're not, you're not on my team. I need the people on my team that will help me validate that belief. And that's, that's how she went after it. And all of us, the whole family, we trooped around her and she refused for anybody to see her as a victim. We actually kept it a secret for a long time. Um, it was our own little, the four of us, me, my brother, and my dad, and my mom. It was her own little family secret that she had um, terminal cancer. She kept it from everybody because she was just like, I don't want any pity. I don't want to have to worry about anybody worrying about me. I need to like come face to face with this and see what happened. And um, it was a lot of stress that she had added on to herself. It was a lot of attachment to things that didn't mean anything. It was a lot of shame and guilt over the past and grief over what had been lost in Iran and feeling guilty over leaving family in Iran, feeling guilty over her mom and dad passing away that she just had carried. And it was just really time to put all that down and say, I, I, I'm going to make myself sick. And I have made myself sick um, and over nurtured everybody um, by not taking care of myself. So she got into a habit of deep, deep mindset work. And she also got into a really healthy eating habit. She's probably the eat healthiest eater I've ever met. So um, she's super healthy woman. All her checkups always come out clean. And she's just that person that no matter what's happening, you go to her. And she's like, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my instincts. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about anything. I'm like, okay. <laughs> she's she, she, my mom's a badass. My mom's a hard, hard working badass. She's incredible work ethic. And um, yeah, she's, she's a tough chick. Let's talk about mindset that um, she gave you. Do you think, um, well, obviously you got that from your mother and your father, but is that as a woman who owns two law firms in Georgia, you, um, a disability law firm and a family law, a divorce law firm, you uh, and your mother of two kids, soon to be three, uh, is that who you get your mindset from as far as, yes, we can do this and we can just execute this in a formidable way? Yeah, I think it. Uh, my mom definitely has that sense of curiosity over everything. And my dad has this too where they don't start anything with a, when you, when you talk to them about something, you never hear them say, no, they never start from a place of no. They always come, come from a place of curiosity. That's the first thing. Curio the second thing is resourcefulness. And I think that that's the mindset that they really taught me. Um, when I was little and I would be in my bedroom in Sweden, my dad would, um, we would have these long talks in my bedroom and I would, he would say like, what do you want to do? And, and he would always like, let me just imagine and envision and daydream. He always, they both took me to a place of a lot of daydreaming, especially my dad. And um, he would say, you know, through the window of your room, there is a path to exactly where you want to go. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, well, you would get out the window, you would climb down, like the little thing and then you would get on your bike and then you would go to school I mean, he would just like tell you very pragmatically there is a way to everything you want in your life there's a from that window there's a path to everything you want and so my dad was always like helped me dream and never limit the dream and then but my mom brought in the resourcefulness of okay like she he was my heaven he was my sky he was she was my earth of like okay let's get like 
real about how this is going to be done. And she can't stop thinking about it till she figures out the solution. And so that's kind of the mindset that got me. And my dad was curiosity. My mom was resourcefulness. That is so cool how you can delineate those. And um, I don't think I've ever really thought about the difference between my mom and dad as far as what they, you know, but I love how you said the heaven and the earth as far as resourcefulness. That I is... actually stole that from Amy Tan. She, uh, okay. I don't know the name of the book, but yeah, she's an author. She talks about, she wrote that in one of her books. I'm like, oh my God, that's my parents. Do you instill a lot of these um, daydreaming resources, resourcefulness? Do you instill a lot of that in your two children? I try to. Um, it is, I, I find it sometimes hard <laughs> not to shame my children for not having more hunger. <laughs> That's probably where my biggest challenge comes from as a parent. Isn't that um, crazy? How do you teach that? I mean, I do you have to know. move your kids to like a village in northern Sweden? I mean, I mean the Arctic Circle? I mean, the coronavirus circle? gave us a little big gift of that where it was like, okay, guys, look, toilet paper. There's no toilet paper. <laughs> like, what do I tell you? There's no, you know, was, we can't leave the house. We got to be resourceful. It was a little bit of gift of that. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, what Don Morgan has the book called you can't teach hungry which is the very discouraging um <laughs> because i just remember being their age and i was so hungry and i wanted so much and i and i'm not saying my children aren't they obviously have completely different gifts that they are going to show us if i give them enough space to show it but i have a really hard time not being attached to my own story of having to work hard for everything I have and having to, you know, mature quickly through certain things. And then I look at my children, I'm like, man, I would have given everything to have some of the things you have. I can't even figure out how to get rid of toys. Yeah. Yeah. At Christmas. So, I mean, any advice there for me? I mean, I don't. Uh, so what we do is we don't introduce, we don't let them open up any other new toys. So we go through all the old toys and get donate thank you All right. yeah i mean i don't know that. how helpful that is we're still i mean i'm still talking to you from the basement of my house with a room playroom filled with toys so right yeah it's, it's it, it, i there has to be something different for our children right like there's they have to have their own story but it, you can't help it as a parent to just wonder how is this going to play out with all the conveniences you have I'm sure they have, they're having their own challenges. We don't. There's got to be something about the world of social media and internet that they're growing up in that's going to cause its own lessons. I'd like to think that the rest of their story is unwritten. I mean, we weren't little children when 9-11 happened. Um, we don't know what the future holds as far as economic fallout after this and what the world looks like after this. So yeah. that's what I keep kind of telling myself um, is that there's, there's a lot yet to see with them. And, uh, but I, I do like the, um, donating. I think we've tried something like that before, but I th then we have the circumstance where three years later, they will remember that toy and say, what did we do with that? You donated it. And then that there's a meltdown. So, yep. Yep. <laughs> you're, you're a bad guy. You gave my toy away. Yeah. And I was like, no dude, you donated it. You gave it to a kid that didn't have that He-Man toy. So, um, mindset. Do you think that's part of what brought you and Hisham together? For sure. For sure. I don't think we knew of it at the time. Um, I was 18 when Sham and I met. He was, he was, I was, yeah, I was 18. He was 20. Where did and, you meet? <laughs> you'll love this because you were, you're techie. He was at Georgia Tech. I was at Georgia State. I had just graduated high school, just started college. It was literally my first month into college and our mutual friend from high school introduced us and, um, we met up at the Georgia State dorms that Georgia Tech now took over. Thank you very much. Um, that, that's where we met. And, and we've I mean, been together ever since. I love that. Cool. So not yeah. quite high school sweethearts, but but pretty close. Yeah, college sweethearts. I, I, I think about how lucky we are that we've grown old. Like, I don't, we're not old yet. I refuse to say we're old. But that we've grown um, up together. And we've grown up together in a very linear way. And I'm grateful for that. But and I also wonder how it happened because 
I know that's definitely not the case for a lot of 18 year olds that meet and are able to um, grow up together and the way we have. And I think it's because in our essence, in our core, we're very, very similar, which is we both are just not satisfied with the status quo. We both have this like innate hunger to challenge ourselves, to always go for more, to be more, to do more. Um, we're just, we're not looking, neither one of us are the type of person that's just like waiting around for comfort. We're just waiting around for the next adventure and for the next challenge. And I think that's what brought us together. Um, so I think our core values are very similar and that's where mindset comes from. We're both very competitive, you know, that's definitely been good. Yeah. Something I have a hard time with and um, y'all seem to be doing a pretty good job of is you are either, you know, moving forward or you're regressing. You're never still. Yeah. And um, I am reminded of that involuntarily every time I try to get a little bit comfortable. It just, yeah. it just doesn't work. So um, that's really neat. So y'all meet, uh, you've been together since then. He takes his corporate America job, and it, at some point in, in the near future, I'd love to get Hisham on my podcast because he has a remarkable story as well. But love it, yeah. And he's clearly one of the coolest guys I know. But um, he's in corporate America. He's doing the typical thing I see so many fellow Georgia Tech graduates do. Um, they get an engineering job or a consulting job. They're doing very well. They're making very good money, but something's missing. You know, the yeah. guy the guy across the street from me. Um, Georgia Tech graduate, graduated in 07, I think. Um, same sort of story. He uh, wound up buying a car mechanic shop, and that's his full-time gig now. It's a big shop. It's in Buckhead. forget the name of it, but um, does very well, And uh, but he loves it. You know, it's it's just sort of what he was meant for, but um, Hisham, how did he come into with mom owning two law firms, Hisham having the nice, steady corporate gig? How did he come into owning his business or starting that? And what was that like? What was that effect on the family? So, so one of the things that brought his sham and I together, and it goes back to what you asked about our mindset and how that might have helped us to find each other, is the other part about his sham and I that is very similar is we both have this nature of giving up instant gratification, giving up instant results or seeing something now and being willing to play a long-term game so both of us have always been that way where we're we're fine if we're not living a um shiny light comfortable life right now we're always striving for the longer game and we built a long-term game together while um we were together in college and we when we knew that we were going to get married we we're like okay what does that look like well it makes most sense to not get married till I get out of law school. So I have to get to law school. So I did college in three years and got to law school. And then we always knew that we were going to, uh, one of us was going, he was going to do corporate wor world after he graduated Georgia Tech, which was in 04. And he would start building us savings and he would start building up a life for us financially so that when we get married, when I come out of law school, we could get started. Um, once I graduated law school, we knew that we built a 10 year plan. Okay. We, one of us is going to go into entrepreneurship because we saw that as a way for ultimate growth and freedom. And so the plan was one, when it makes sense, we're going to start saving money. Now we're only going to live off one income. Cause I was working at a law firm. He was in the corporate world. We're only going to live off one income and save the other one for startup. A business startup. Some point, when I became pregnant in 2012, it was um, the plan was I should be the one to start the law firm and go out on my go out, out first. So you decided to be an entrepreneur entrepreneur when you became pregnant. Yes, that the pregnancy ca was the catalyst for it, and it might have been not the right way to think about it. But what I had seen around me and and the and other women lawyers is. They either get out of the legal field or they're not really able to, if they're working big law firm jobs, they seem to be very stressed and not very happy with their jobs um, because they're missing out on so much with their children. 
or they're going the in-house counsel. God, I, agree I didn't want to retire. I didn't want to be an in-house counsel and I didn't want to work miserable billable hours. Totally so agree. None of those were, yeah, none of will, those were an option. I will quit the law before I, before I go back to working for somebody. <laughs> right. And this is like, I'm three years out of law school. I've just started my legal career. I'm not, I'm not doing any of these things. And, um, so that it was like, okay, let's start my own law firm. And he was like, this is what we'll do. We'll get this law firm up and running. Once this law firm can replace our household income, then I will leave as well. Because I think he knew inside of him that he wanted to have, we knew he, we wanted him to have the option of going out on his own when the time came. I don't think we had made an official decision that he would do it because he really, really loved his job. He was with a great company. He was growing really fast. And I mean, it's a great company to grow with, but we just always wanted to build something where if that if we could have that option, because if there was something we had learned from um, my life lesson and he can share his parents' life lessons that you want to leave yourself with those options as much as you possibly can um, and never feel tied to anything. Um, so I built the CAC, I started the CACI law firm not until baby was out and, you know, a year old. So that was like in 2013, October 2013, I started the CACI law firm. And uh, it's a social security disability firm. Takes Back then it took two years for disability firms to get their pipelines to start seeing an income because they're getting contingency payments from the, uh, comp the government. However, um, that we had that circumstances circumstances changed with the government and that law firm did not become profitable until 2016. It actually became profitable well, late into 2016. So 2013 I, to 2016. Yep, yep. So, you know, God really tests the people to have the capacity for certain things. And apparently I really had the capacity to run a law firm for three and a half years on basically not on, on not having any revenue from it and it was just build the pipeline and the pipeline was a seven figure pipeline we were getting in enough business we were carrying enough of a caseload and had enough staff in there that looked like a seven figure law firm but the revenue the attorney's fees were all they were all waiting on the government to pay them out and they were supposed to start being paid out early 2016 according to the three-year business plan we created. Um, and come year 2016, we've borrowed as much money, we've put in all the money from our nest egg, we've borrowed as much money as we could from Hisham's dad who said, don't take a line of credit, don't borrow any money, I'll give you guys money. So at this point, we owe Hisham's dad close to 200,000. We have, we're living off of one income um, we have an infant, my daughter, and we have a toddler. Hisham is in the corporate world traveling like two weeks at a time out of uh, not, not being home. We have moved from our home in Chattanooga because we lived there for a little bit while he was in the corporate world and I was in law, the law firm back to Atlanta. Our house in Chattanooga is not selling because the market, the housing market was not so good. So we have that mortgage happening. We can't afford to buy a house in Atlanta. So we are living out of my parents' house. <laughs> so I'm just going to paint this picture. Living out of my high school bedroom with my husband, who's traveling all the time, um, having a baby, have a baby, and have a toddler, and running a law firm with a staff of like seven people that manages about 40 new cases per month, a total of about 800 cases in the pipeline, waiting, just waiting for it to start so that we can stop borrowing money on this case thing. And the first quarter of 2016, it was supposed to start trickling in. It doesn't. It doesn't start coming in. So we're like, um, literally at this point, like, okay, Hisham takes money out of his 401k. He puts money out of it from his 401k. That's like the last straw. So summer comes. The government freeze happens on attorney's fees. We go three months without any attorney's fees. At this point, borrowing money from parents, like my parents, which to me was like so much guilt and shame doing that because it's like my parents have blood, sweat, and tears to get me here, get me through law school, get me to this country, and now I've started a business. I'm living out of their home. 
my parents are still working, they're in their 60s, and I'm living out their home, and now I'm taking their savings, pouring it into this business. So it was a low point. It was a really, really low point. But thankfully, it all happened because it was a huge gift. It's what really was the catalyst to say, I will not wait on the government to decide if my business is going to be successful or not. I'm going to take the matter of my own hands. Um, and I started the divorce firm. I always wanted to have a family law firm. I had a very strong opinion about divorce, had a strong opinion about custody matters and family law and all of that. And um, so I took the infrastructure of the social security firm, got the admin team. To, I went to my team and I said, guys, I need your help. We need to start a second line of um, income. We need another source of revenue into this business so we can keep the khaki law firm going. And so we started the Atlanta Divorce Law Group in August of 2016. It took off really quickly. It actually spun our heads how quickly that thing took off. And I'll say this, <clears throat> as a plug for both your firms, I've referred people to um, both of them. And one thing I think that was probably instrumental or an absolute necessity of uh, starting the second law firm, the Divorce Law Group, was absolute quality of service. And... Um, and I think that's certainly what you've done. And um, yes, it makes sense from a business standpoint. In family law, you get the revenue up front or you take a retainer, then you're, you're paid off the retainer agreement. And um, But you yourself, you you do get your hands dirty a little bit with the family law cases, right? What is your involvement with family? Coming from a background of disability, what is your involvement with the divorce law group? So for me, the um, in the divorce law group, what I've done is the quality control of the cases. And I appreciate, Jim, you um, mentioning that. Um, we really built an infrastructure in the divorce firm where client communication would not be an issue for the client. Clients, you know, even though that their cases are going on for three years, they would never feel like they're not, they have to reach out to us to hear about what's going on. And that was one of the biggest things I was seeing in family law firms is that attorneys get burnt out. Um, client, the, the real issue of the real personal pain of what's going on behind the divorce matter is not really being heard because these cases are just being seen as, oh, this is a simple divorce. This is an uncontested, un this is a uncontested divorce. This is a complex divorce, a high asset divorce. And just taking it out of those boxes and challenging the legal team to see the personal of what really is the pain point, what really is the goal behind what each of these clients are looking for. They don't really understand that as attorneys, our job is, they don't see our job as limited to here's your divorce decree. They really see us as setting them up for the vision of what they have, what life could be after divorce. That's where my involvement is, where I'm getting in and I'm challenging the team on are we each person, whether it's a paralegal or attorney, a, a communication happening? Where's the system breaking down as far as if this client didn't get what they needed in time, or if the client had to reach out to get an us status update from us, why didn't our system already get ahead of that? And then most importantly, where are they going to be a year after divorce? Where are they going to be a two years after divorce? I'm not that interested to know about what is the divorce going to deliver them rather how, it, how what does their life look like a year or two after divorce and helping the client see that from the onset and reverse engineer that backwards. What do the mechanics of owning both law firms? Um, now, jumping back real quick, I'm sorry, the disability, happy, not ending, but I mean, happy resolution there. It is profitable now. It's, um, it yes. is the million, it's, it's a million dollar law firm. So is the family law firm as well. The, Go ahead and give the name of, of the divorce thing, the full name of it, so if people want to look you up. Yeah, the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, and the tagline there is Happily Ever After Divorce, and the CACI Law Firm, which is the Social Security Disability Firm. Excellent. What do the mechanics of having a third baby look like with running day-to-day -day operations? What is your plan there? I have uh, an awesome, awesome team, and... You know, I have leaders in each team that have been with me from very early on, and I am not the smartest person in either one of my law firms. That's the basic mechanics if I was to boil it down to one thing, is I'm just a curious, resourceful person in the room, 
that helps get the resources and asks the questions. But I, and that, that was a moment of a lot of growth for me, a lot of personal growth, to not be the person with the answers. But finding much smarter people than myself that would easily outshine me in any courtroom, in any um, marketing conversation, in any, any place where these skills matter, they would outshine me. And, but I, thankfully, I've had a vision that has brought them a lot to, together. So in the CAC, the CAC law firm and the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, they share one business manager who's sort of my right-hand woman. Her name is Stacey Zimmerman. She's been with me since I started the tacky law firm in October of 2013. She was a part-time office coordinator that we kind of grew up together building these businesses. And she really just had faith in what I was building and um, was going through a lot of our own family um, struggles between her baby and then later on with her divorce that her journey just really aligned with the missions our firms were going through. And so she really just rolled up her sleeves and has um, taken ownership of the vision and implemented executed on things that I probably do not have the discipline on a day in day out to execute and implement the way she can and letting her do that, giving her the, the letting her gift shine and do that has been amazing. Cause she basically is the business manager of both these law firms and will make sure those infrastructures are working. So the she runs, I'm firm. sorry. Did you say she runs both of those? She helps run both of those as a, as a business slash office manager for both. Yeah. Um, in the khaki law firm, the legal team is held together by, um, the, is by our director of legal operations, Patrice Callahan, who has been with us since 2014. Um, I hired her, at, you know, she'd been practicing social security for eight years and I brought her in to a social security firm. And again, she's just one of the, where I dream and envision like the infrastructure and I dream and envision what the client experience would be like, she's the one that brings it to life and says, okay, well, let's talk about actually how this is going to happen and who I'm going to need in my team to get this to be done. And here are all the ways that social security is going to cause problems for us. And she makes it, make, she makes it real for the, for the, as far as the legal team goes. And then in the divorce firm, I mean, I'm, I can't even say how grateful I am to our litigation manager, Jeanette Soltis. She had her own law firm, and I went to her very early on when I started the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, and I said, you know, I need your help to help me work some of these cases. You have much more experience than I do. She's been practicing family law for close to 15 years. She used to be the head of DFAX. Um, and she said, sure, I'll help you. She came from a mindset of, I'll help you. She didn't look at it as... Who are you competing with me, right? I'm sorry. Did you say she was chief counsel at DFAX? She was one of, yeah. She was, um, I think it's called a SAG or something like that. I'm not sure the exact terminology, but yeah, she was a litigator for DFAX. That's really good to know for any lawyers or, um, listening. I think that's um, that's an incredible resource, you know, yeah. for a lot of families. And she's our child custody expert. And, um, and you know, we, we, we had a couple of lunches and conversations and very quickly realized that our vision is very much aligned. And the only reason Jeanette was hesitant to, to work inside of another law firm is because she had been in so many other toxic law firm environments and really just never wanted to exchange her mental health for a paycheck again. And so I was like, listen, just give me a chance. Come here and we'll build this culture together. And she took a chance on that and God bless her. She did. And I wouldn't be able to do what we do without her. And i um, really excited to tell you that, you know, just next week we're bringing in another very, very senior attorney that's coming in as director of operations for the Atlanta divorce law group. That's going to help me take a legit maternity leave. So it's really just being honestly, it's, it's not a magic pill. There's nothing I'm doing technically that's that magical other than, just keeping my eyes open for the talent, being curious about what it would look like, letting my husband call me out on a lot of, you know, my BS and, um, or people or friends like you do that as well. Um, and diving into mindset work and seeing where my blind spots are and then getting curious and resourceful and finding the talent and, um, putting, giving, letting them release their gift. What are some of your daily success routines? things that you do that are non-negotiable um, could be 
meditation, it could be morning routines. What are things you do every day to make sure that you are in the right frame of mind? Um, for me, it's been more about how I've set up my environment. Like, for instance, I have to have fresh roses around the house. That Shut up. Seriously? Yeah, I just does something from my mindset. Like, there's several white, it has to be white, fresh roses. I don't know why. I saw white, fresh roses on your Facebook Live. Yeah, yeah. That's not just for Facebook Live. They're all throughout the house. Um, they really <laughs> do something for me. I know it's so silly. Um, I listen to mindset. I don't, I barely ever drive without listening to something. So it's either a good, great podcast, like the one you're making, David Nagel's successful mind podcast. I have an audible account that is nothing but just mindset and business books. Um, I, there's, I've tried a lot of different routines. I wish I could come here and said, you know, like I wake up at 5 a.m. and I play a mean course of tennis and then I, you know, meditate and I do my yoga and I journal for 30. I've tried all of that and I've never been consistent enough with any of them. I know they work miracles for some people. And I know you've done them too. And um, I think you did it really successfully actually. For a while. Don't yes. be humble. <laughs> um, I, so I, I admire people that are able to do that. I've never been able to be that consistent with anything, but I do work out. That helps. I would say more than anything, it's my physical space and the people space. I'm very, very careful about who comes into my personal space. I didn't used to always be that way. I was that girl that turned, you know, 21 and had 50 different people, half of them strangers, half of them I knew come to my birthday party because it was like the more the merrier. I very much have like moved away from that. And um, I'm very, very select, selective on who comes into my personal space who I get really, really close to, not because I'm better than anyone by any means. It's just because I'm so protective over my mindset and what I expose myself to. So I'm not very, I'm not probably not very quick to jump into a lot of relationships and friendships. And sometimes that comes off a little standoffish. Um, but I've, I, that's, that's what's worked for me is just to be very careful with how I spend my time and with who I spend my time. It's like, well, girl, you got two kids, almost three, and you got a husband. I don't, uh, I don't think people really, I'm sure, expect too much uh, as far as personal relationships with folks that are in our position, you know? Well, you know, the other part is for me is that um, when I'm having it and when I'm in a friendship with somebody, I really want to give and there's a certain standard of giving I want to do. And I've learned about myself that I start feeling shameful and guilty about when I don't meet that standard. And whether that's healthy or not, it is what it is. So I really have to be careful with who I want to give all those things to because I will, I have only so much of myself to, of time, like you said, and I just have to um, make sure I select carefully because it will be more of a mindset let down for myself than anything. Okay. And I, I know you've got a day uh, to run in two law firms to, um, manage but let me ask you this you and uh, back to you and Hisham real quick um do y'all have any do y'all have like family budget meetings do y'all have business budget meetings things where y'all get together get away from the kids for example my wife and I we we try to do it quarterly but it really winds, winds up working out um, twice a year where we get away from the kids and we'll go out we'll just it's like in a hotel but I mean like in Atlanta but it's like conference room style and then we'll put all the spreadsheets together and say, what does our next three, six, 12 months look like? And then we come to some sort of understanding of what the plan is. And it really helps a lot as far as you know, the marriage, the, um, the business side of what it takes to run a marriage as well. Do y'all have anything like that? Oh yeah. And Jim, I'm so impressed that you would do that too. Or I don't think Sham and I've heard a lot of other couples do that. Yes, absolutely. One of the reasons we got into this habit and became very strict about it is once, um, so like backing up, I mentioned that we have like this 10 year plan of I'll go to law school, you go into corporate world, we'll build this, we'll do yada, 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 and then we'll get into, become entrepreneurs and we'll um, feed ourselves. And when we, once we had accomplished that, when we really sat down and realized we had accomplished that, one thing we it was um, April of 2017. 
because in April of 2017, Hisham had officially put in his last day at the corporate world after 14 years. And I remember, and I, and we had for six months straight been paying our life's expenses out of the law firm. So we no longer had lived off of his salary for six months. He had received his last paycheck and he came home from his last day of the corporate world. And I think we just looked at each other and we're like, holy crap, like it, it happened. Like what we dreamt about from when we were in college, it actually happened. It was amazing. And we had a lot of like celebrations that year where we like lived through a lot of dreams we had, like as far as travel, doing cool things for our parents and um, different things that just had meant something to us in our vision. The end of 2017, I think we had a moment where we were like, what's next? this is this isn't it like you know that was that was the dream we built to get here now we need the next dream and we almost felt ourselves getting into a funk if we didn't really quickly build another vision because then it would be like <clears throat> going against our nature which is just sitting here comfortable waiting for to turn into dust in the wind or whatever it is um so in february of 2018 hisham surprised me and he he talked to our friends in Miami and he was like, I want to take Sarah somewhere that's just going to like make us envision the next 10 years of our life. That's just going to be bigger than life. And so our friend in Miami, he's actually a law firm coach. His name is R. John Robbins with How to Manage a Small Law Firm. He said to Hisham, I have the best idea. You guys should go spend a couple of nights at the Versace mansion in Miami. It's expensive, but it's a great place to build a vision because every corner you look, it's just something that like handmade art throughout this entire castle, really, that's just going to inspire you for what a man can create with their own hands. Right. Cause there's just, it's, there's so much beauty in every detail of that house. Um, so he surprised me and he took me there and I just have to add this part. This is so crazy, right? Just when you decide to line yourself up and say yes, because, that wasn't a cheap trip and that wasn't like a, that was, that was pretty expensive per night to stay in, but he just decided to take that leap. And like the universe always shows up or whatever you believe is the higher source. Guess who was playing in the garden that night and the, in the little pool pool of the mansion. Who? John Bon Jovi. <laughs> so we check into this house, like a seven bedroom house. And they're like, Oh, by the way, Tonight, John Bon Jovi's having a private garden party by the pool for only like his closest 50 friends for this new wine he's releasing. You guys are welcome to go join. We're like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Come again? <laughs> so we start off building. So we that night, we literally like were sit, standing in front of John Bon Jovi while he's singing in front of the pool, like in this intimate little garden, listening to, um, you know, the music of our childhood. Yes. You, you, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Living on a prayer. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, exactly. Like all the bed of roses. Great songs. Listen to yeah. while you're going to rebuild a vision. And so, yeah, the next morning we got up in this beautiful house. And just like you mentioned, of course, my Georgia Tech husband, similar to you, had all the spreadsheets out. He had all the Excel spreadsheets out of let's get to work. Let's roll up our sleeves. So let the and record reflect the that is my wife with the spreadsheets, not me. She is the engineer. Did Katie yeah. go to Georgia Tech too? She did. She has a, a master's in civil engineering from tech as, as well as an undergrad. Yeah. She's, she's the That's real brain. Dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't go to Georgia Tech, but he, yeah. So we sat there and we built the next five year plan for our vision. And we did create just like you described Year one, what is the budget going to look like? What's the budget going to look like for year two, year three, year five? We really built out what we want to happen in year five and reverse engineered it from there and build an um, actual like P&L for every year, budget for every year. What, where do we want to do? And then we created like um, almost like a board of hits and misses of what we're going to accomplish for the next year. And every six months we do a check-in. Um, we haven't gone and stayed somewhere like that again. We now we can just really, once we got that outline done, we do our, our, every six, six months, we do a vision quest check-in where we look at the budget and we look at where we're at, where we want to go. Are we on target? Has anything changed? Obviously the baby changed a lot of things. So <laughs> we had to revisit a lot of things, but every month at the end of the month, 
you know, you can create all this mindset of abundance and create all the luxury you want. But at the end of the day, you still have to know where are you headed financially and just bring some common sense to things. And every month we do look at our household budget, just like we would for a business and make sure we're on target and make sure that each of us are on target for what we want to bring into the household. How often do you put your heads together in this sort of fashion? The actual looking at the budget of the household is once a month, but I would have to say talking business together and talking vision together, that's probably daily. We probably don't go through a day where we're not talking about, like, imagine this or imagine that and, um, oh, I have this thought and we're talk, calling each other out on, like, you know, that's a limiting mindset you're having or, you know, that's not how it's going to be and or call each other out on something for sure. For anybody listening that thinks you're crazy as far as owning two law firms, $2 million law firms, and then your husband being an entrepreneur as well, and they want to take sort of a peek into these mindset things that you talk about, what is a great resource that you, if there is one resource that you could recommend for anybody that you have to read this, listen to this, what would that be? I would have to say it would be... Um, for both Hisham and I, where it brought it all together to one place for us, it was really David Nagel. Um, he, you've been to one of the events with us. Absolutely. Um, it's incredible. It's incredible. And uh, the Successful Mind podcast is a free podcast on iTunes that he provides. And it's not limited to any legal or engineering or anything. It's for anybody, for anybody that just is... In, in curious about themselves, curious to learn more about what they're made of personally, whatever that's going to look, if it's just curious about getting over some kind of a pain, it's curious about get, getting over some kind of a growth hurdle or business. I, I think he really, he brought a lot of things together for us and then he brought it together for us as a couple. That was, that was really, really cool. That's really special. Well, I think with that, um, I think we can close it out. Um, real, I know you already mentioned both your law firms, but if people want to get in touch with you, um, if they want to message you, where how can they follow you and keep in touch with you? Yeah, I, add me on Facebook, um, Sarah Tacky, S-A-R-A, last name K-H-A-K-I. Um, you can add me on Facebook and feel free to message me on there for the law firms. It's for the Atlanta Divorce Law Group. It's Sarah at atldivorcegroup.com. And for the Tacky Law Firm, it's Sarah at thecackylawfirm.com and share without an H. And you reminded me of something you're doing. You do periodically, I think, I want to say maybe a couple times a week, maybe once a week. I see it frequently on Facebook, a Facebook live where you have a guest on there. You've had Dave Nagel, um, our mutual friend, Jason Wiggum, um, mm -hmm. you know, folks from your divorce firm. Uh, why did you start that? You know, I started it right when the coronavirus thing happened and I just felt such a need to do something because when the, when the pandemic happened and everybody went into quarantine, I remember having a little bit of, I don't know if the word is survivor's guilt, but just having this feeling like, oh my God, all this investment Hisham and I've made in each other and on ourselves as far as mindset goes, as far as business goes, to get ourselves to a point where this is not freaking us out and we're actually looking looking at this and we're seeing all the positive in it and seeing all the ways that we're going to thrive in this i saw it as a luxury as a result of the upbringing i've had and also as a luxury as a result of all the in personal investment i've had but i'm very mindful that there's a lot of people that didn't for whatever reason did not have that and i i just had a hard time sitting by not wanting to do something and i didn't that's that's what i came up with is how about I highlight other business owners? How about I highlight all the resources I have? And here's all the itches I'm scratching right now. I want to learn about, you know, SBA, you know, loans. I'm going to call Jason, my friend Jason Wiggum to learn about it. I'm having a mindset issue. I'm going to call uh, my mentor David to help me about it. But what if I shared those things? Because if I'm going through it, everybody else is. So what if we just shared and openly talk about it? If I'm concerned about 401k accounts, I'm going to call Ted Jenkins. Maybe we can bring him on and he can, instead of him and I having a private conversation, we have it publicly so everybody else can benefit from it. I, it's just the smallest way I could figure out to just do something. 
There's certainly something to be said about scratching your own itch there. That's right. Um, and that's why I think I'm probably most thankful for you coming on the podcast is because getting into your mindset is so inspiring. Um, I'm about to run through a brick wall right now. So um, I, pre- <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, no, you got me fired up. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. So, but anytime you want to come back on, there's something to talk about. We can, uh, whether it's current issues or things like that, then God, you are always welcome here. Thank you, Jim. And I've, it's been so, I feel like you and I have grown up together a bit here because you, when I started the Kathy Law Firm, you were one of the very first refer, referral sources of the firm. And you and I would have um, lunches at the Houston's at, uh, back in Buckhead. And you were always so encouraging in such positive energy and you made uh, networking fun when it sometimes just isn't fun you know. <laughs> and you made it real and it was I felt so safe and comfortable sharing with you which I which is why obviously you should have your own podcast because it's just so easy to share with you um and I mean I I don't think if it wasn't for people like you that I was like man like I want to I want to do what he's doing when I was struggling I I wouldn't have made it so thank you for having this podcast thank you for following your dream because i remember about a year ago when you're like i'm going to do this and you did it so many people talk about doing it and they don't you did it that's right it was um you actually have to do it and you you have to forget about uh validation and you have to forget about who might or might not listen and then just do it because you enjoy it and uh Yeah. yeah thanks for being inspiring thanks for coming on this podcast and uh Actually, talk to me right after this, but um, I'll go ahead and end it right now. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.